Once you get your word, you get that word in you until you believe it. Because usually when you get a word, what you're looking at is absolute opposite of the word. If you ask him for his opinion, his opinion is usually completely polar opposite of what your natural eyes are looking at. So you're going to have to get that word so in you that you believe the word more than what your eyes are looking at. So how do you believe that? How do you do that? What you meditate on is what you believe. So if you're going to stand there all day and just look at the mess and look what he said today, and if you heard, did you look at her social media today? And did you, she's blocked me now. Come on, did you hear what she did? If you're going to do that all day long, that's what you're going to believe. But if you turn around right here, you take this word, you meditate on this word day and night, you're not even looking at the natural. You seek this word till it's all in your spirit. And this is what you believe. Come on, then you pray the word. Once you get your word, I love it. Ephesians calls this word your sword. It's a two-edged sword. You use that sword. I use, I wrote down every promise God gave me for Lindsay on an index card. So my little index cards just grew thicker and thicker and thicker. And I would keep them in this Bible. And I would take my Bible and I would put them in there at night. When I didn't know where she was sleeping or where she was, I would sleep with my Bible like this at night and I would cling to every promise that he gave me. I held to the word. Come on. And what you do is you take every promise. And I would go to prayer mountain. I would take my promises and I'd pray just like this, praying them out loud, quoting every promise God gave me over my daughter day and night day and night. Pam can tell you, night and day, day and night. Come on, weeks turn to months and months turn to a couple of years, but it was day and night, day and night. Quoting the word, quoting the word. Listen, look at me. Right here. Praying the word is the most life-giving thing you can do for them. It's the most powerful thing you can do. There's not a stronger prayer you can pray. You pray the word God gives you. Because according to Isaiah, his word doesn't return for it. That's why it's so wonderful because it don't matter what town they live in. It doesn't matter if they blocked you on Facebook, Instagram, been there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they blocked you and told you they ain't coming home to Thanksgiving or Christmas. Doesn't really matter. Because what the thing they make can block you off your Facebook, Instagram, they can't block what you're doing in the prayer closet. Come on. Oh, come on. They may block you on that phone, but they can't block what that mother's doing in that prayer closet. Oh, decreeing the word of God. Oh, come on. The word will go out of your mouth. It'll travel to where they are. He'll go in a hotel room. He'll go in a crack house. He'll go wherever he's got to go because his word will not return void. Do you believe that? No, no, no. I don't even know where I'm at. Come on. I'll tell you one last thing. And I'm going to wrap it up. I'll tell you this. Let me just give you a couple of verses God gave me. Because evidently, there's some prodigals about to come home. Yeah. Yeah. Evidently. Pam, hey, my Bible, I need you to look up 2 Corinthians in your Bible, New Living. Do you have it, New Living? Lauren, do you have it? When Lindsay was gone, Thank you, New Living. Look it up, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. I got, that was when she was gone, a bit carried away. (laughs) So, I was, this is what blew me away is when this word becomes rhema, and you ask for a word. And I just love it when you're reading this Bible that you've read over and scriptures over and over. And then that day you read it, that the day you're looking for a promise. And on that day you're reading it and that verse, whoa, there it is. Whoa. Why? Because this book is a voice. Come on. People that say this book is boring just don't know the one that wrote it. Come on. This book speaks. It's living. It's alive. It talks. 
And when she was gone, I remember reading this verse I'd read so many times. And I was in my house one day in the living room praying for her. And, and she, here she was in this horrible place. And, and then I, re- I read it, just what I read a while ago. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. I don't know why I'd never seen it like I did that day. I'm like, whoa, he's given me this task. For God was in Christ. Okay, but I am Christ's ambassador. God is making his appeal. God is making his appeal through me. Well, this is God call. This is God praying for her. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I thought that's it. That's all I need to know. I just put it to, to action right then. I walked out on my front porch. God is making his appeal through me. I speak for Christ when I plead, come back to God. So I walked out of my front porch of my house. I shut that door behind me. I stood on that front porch. She was living an hour away. God is making his appeal. I speak for Christ when I plead, come back to God. I speak for Christ when I plead, come back to God. His word will not return void. When it comes out of my mouth, then I'm going to call her home. So I did just like this. Lindsay! Now, when you quote that kind of word, it's the word. I'm not making it up. Some people say, well, that kind of praying is controlling people. It it would be controlling people if I was praying my will. I'm not. I'm praying God's will. So when I'm praying the word of God over here, heard saying, God, your will be done in her. I'm not controlling her. I'm setting her free with the word of God. Don't let people tell you you're controlling her just because you're praying for her. That's a lie of the devil trying to get you to quit praying. There's a saying that we have where it's the pig pen always works. It always works. He will take away everything from them if that's what it takes. Everything. And it's going to be very difficult to see them go through some of this, to see them hurting to see them lose things, to see them, I don't know, maybe even homeless, I don't know. But the pig pen always works. And even in the prodigal son's story, there's one translation. There's one translation where it says, and he came to himself and said, I will go to my father's house. But that first thing was, he came to himself. In that pig pen, he had to come to realize, I'm a son. This isn't me. This is not what I'm supposed to, this is not it. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. You'll know whenever that day comes if if they have completely changed. Not not if, when they have completely changed. My husband, whenever I came home, this was um, January 10th of uh, 2016. We'd been through two years of mediations Uh, court dates. We had to go through four different judges because all the judges knew my mom, so they had to step down from the case. And the case ended up getting sent to the Supreme Court of Alabama, and then they had to assign a judge who was not ministry connected in any way because it's Alabama. It's a Bible belt, you know. So they had to find somebody that did not know who our family was to handle the divorce case. So it was two years long And of course, I'm sitting there like, why is this taking forever? Of course, I'm not, at the time, I'm not even thinking about all the times mom is praying you know, they're supposed to meet today. Don't let them meet today. <laughs> you know, the, it's supposed to go through today. Don't let it go through today. Um, court date is here. Let something happen where it gets delayed. And it did, one after another. You know, another case, another case took precedence, or the judge was sick, or he's out of town. It was one thing after another after another got delayed. And so January 10th, I woke up and in, in my apartment and weighed out if I go home, this is what it's going to cost me. And I'm going to lose my reputation. I'm going to lose everything. That I will have to come out and tell the truth. I'm going to have to, to be honest about all these things that, that even my husband didn't know about at the time. You know, of things that I had done in those two years. But if I stay, I'm, I'm going to lose my life. This is not worth it. I'm not happy. This is not what I thought this would be at all. And I remember I actually just looked up at my ceiling in my apartment, and all I did was I said, God, my answer is yes. Just as simple as that. God, my answer is yes. 
And in that moment, the overwhelming peace was indescribable. I would have to tell you in tongues. There's no way to to say it in English of what it was like. Of knowing that it's not grace that comes first and then I do it. It's obedience that comes first and then the grace that follows that choice of obedience. It's not just going up to the altar and saying, oh, I'm dealing with this and then picking it back up. It's I'm going to do whatever it is that I have to do to make this right. And I don't care what or who it cost me. At all cost, I'm going to get right with God, period, no matter what. I don't even care at the time. I don't even care if Casey says no to me wanting to go back home. I'm just going to keep asking him until he says yes. At some point, I'll wear him down and he'll just give in. I don't even care. I'm going home. So the long story short, I met, I, I went to my mom first and um, told her, you know, I'd reached out to Casey and I'd sent him an email asking if we could meet. He and I met two days later and it was six hours in one meeting. And I didn't know at the time that he had said to God, in order for me to even give her a chance, she has to say these things. It was one after another. Of, you know, she has to give up this person. She has to be willing to never speak to this one again. She has to cut these people off. I mean, these were family members, some of them, you know, uh, that had paid for the divorce. Um, you know, she has to be willing to give up dancing because at the time that was still my idol. You know, she has, she has to do all of this. And he said later, whenever I walked in, that all of those things were said in the first 15 minutes of our conversation. Because God knew what he needed, what he would need to hear, and God knows what you need. God knows if you're the one believing, what you need to know, that you know this is a different person. This is somebody, I've never even seen this person before. That, that you will know that. You'll have peace in that. That you don't have the questions of, oh, do we, like, is it the promise or is it not the promise? It will be undeniable to you. And you will know God has answered our prayer. We met for six hours that night. Actually, I picked up my keys to go home or go to my mom's house and because I just packed whatever I could. And he actually said to me, and I, and I told him, you know, I, I was a whore. I, I gave myself to anybody. And I was wrong, and I'm sorry, and I'll do anything I have to do to make this right with you. Anything. And I told him, I'll come back tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And, um, and he actually said to me, I don't want you to leave. I want you to stay. In that moment, that showed me a picture of Jesus I, I, I'd never seen before. In all my 30 years of ministry, I'd never seen that. Of all the stories and all the things, I, I'd, never, I'd never seen that. Of absolute unconditional love. Love. 